he's coming. All right, Ted Daywalt um, is the CEO and founder of Vet Jobs. And uh, Ted and I like to harass each other about all sorts hey. of things that have absolutely nothing to do with recruiting. And we've agreed that we're not going to talk about no, anything. We're not talk about okay, good. So um, Ted is going to talk about a topic that, that I think is is going to be really interesting for a lot of folks in the room. Peter was mentioning the, sort of the different areas on companies' websites where you have kind of like a college section and some other section. And for a lot of organizations that have a college section on their websites, you'll also see a military section on their websites as if they have nothing to do with each other. Okay, if you think that, get ready. Uh, before I get started, Secretary of Education put me on the Gainful Employment Commission this year. And we're debating a lot of things down there. And it's uh, really kind of fascinating working with all these bureaucrats. But uh, how many people here, I, I tell you, does everybody here have a degree? Okay. How many of you went to work in the field that you studied as your first job when you came out of college? About 40%. Okay, that's bigger than most of the places I go ask that question. Because the uh, education department is now saying that a school's no good if you can't get a job in the area where you get your degree. Of course, I got a degree in criminology and a degree in uh, government with minor in history, and I went into the military and they made me an engineering officer. I had never <laughs> studied engineering. Okay, the, um, anybody here been in the military? One, two, three. Okay, good. That's good. See me afterwards to give you a coin. But <laughs> the, um, um, there's a lot of misperception about what's going on with veterans. How many of you think veterans are having a tough time finding work? Okay, I see you've been reading the New York Times. The, uh, the reality is the unemployment rate for veterans has always, always been lower than the national unemployment rate all the way back to 1950. When I first presented that in Congress, I have a couple of congressmen tell me, oh, no possible way. But there's this perception because there's these people over at DOL and at the VA who make a career out of saying veterans have a problem. In order to get money out of Congress, you gotta be solving a problem. The overall unemployment rate for all veterans right now is 6.6%, .6%, national 7%. But where there is a problem, and this is for those of you who are in the recruiting field, is in the National Guard and Reserve. The National Guard has been called up so many times, nobody wants to hire them. Last year, the unemployment rate for the National Guard reached 28%. And here's the real significance of that, is that we are downsizing the military. We've gone from 1.2 million down to 800,000, and ultimately it's going to be 600,000 no, 600, total on active duty. Our army is only going to be about 320,000 total. Uh, makes you wonder if you'd want to go to war with China. They've got a 10 million man army right now, but uh, I don't know how 320 is going to do well. But the 60% of our military is going to be in the guard and the reserve. And that's going to impact where you're going to go to find veterans if you want to hire veterans. The, uh, I was speaking at a CEO council one time at a well-known business school and I wasn't introduced for my military background. I was introduced for the different companies I'd run. And one of the, when we got to the Q&A, one of these CEOs said, I'm having a hell of a time trying to find good, strong managers that I can bring in and we can groom them up to be VPs. And I said, well, why don't you implement a senior enlisted hiring program, a JMO, junior military officer hiring program. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. I need people with real world experience. Well, <clears throat> after I got done chewing my tongue off, <laughs> so I wouldn't say things that I shouldn't say, I said, Mike, you don't know this, but I'm a retired Navy captain. How many of your vice presidents, when they went to take their job, they had to go to school for 14 weeks and every Friday they had to take a test and not just pass that test, they had to excel at it or they got fired. 
And then when they got out onto the job, they found out they got all these collateral duties that they didn't know they were going to be stuck with. They're managing a group of, say, 10 or 12 people with an operations budget of 80 to 100 million dollars. If they make a mistake with their equipment, they're going to take the city of Jacksonville and Duval County in Florida off the face of the earth. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, I just gave you the basic job description of a weapons officer on a frigate in Mayport, Florida, who handles nuclear weapons. And by the way, she turns 23 next month. First of all, I couldn't believe it was she. <laughs> but the idea of giving a 23-year-old this type of responsibility, he just couldn't fathom that. Fortunately, people from Walmart and BNSF were there, and they picked up my water and carried it for me. But this is a problem with a lot of recruiters. They don't understand the depth of responsibility that people coming out of the military have. So when you're looking at them, when they're coming out of college, don't look at them for an entry-level job. They won't take it. When I got my MBA, I had eight job offers and four in the hopper. I went to the Guazetta School down at Emory. And one of the companies offered me $19,000. This was back in 1980. All the others were 70 to 120,000. <laughs> and I asked the company, I said, you know, all these people are up here and you're down here. How come? They said, oh, well, you're in the military. We don't count that. We look at you just like you're a student coming straight out of school. I said, thank you very much. And uh, I said other things, but I won't mention them here. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's important that you understand that when you're recruiting veterans. They are used to taking that type of responsibility. At the age of 24, I owned a DDG. That's a guided missile destroyer. I had 400 people working for me. I had a lot of responsibility. That's what they're used to. They crave to get back to where they had that type of responsibility, which is why so many, when they first come out, they job hop until they find what they're looking for. Now, that's partially their fault because they don't know what they're looking for. The transition system on, in the, at DOD is really a, a bad system. But a lot of it is your, your problem. You know, do they think I was actually going to take a job at 19000 after I've been in the military for seven years? They actually did think that. But I told them no, very emphatically. Um, <clears throat> The, if it weren't for the high unemployment rate in the National Guard right now, the overall unemployment number for the military would be about 4.5%, not 6.6. .6. And that's because the National Guard and Reserve are now over half. They're 60% of our total fighting force. So when you're going to be recruiting in the future, if you want military, and I won't go into all the lists about why you want to hire military security clearances and all that good stuff. Most of you know that. But you've got to understand when you bring them in, they're not going to go into an entry-level job. It just, it, it just won't work. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the resources. We helped start Student Veterans of America uh, nine years ago. Uh, put up the money so that they could meet in Chicago. And, and they now have over 800 chapters on campuses around the United States. And here's something I always find is funny. You know, Peter's beat up on me, Jerry's beat up on me, taught me that, you know, 45% of the jobs come, <clears throat> 46 from internet sites, 46% or so from networking, you know, 3% from career fairs and what have you. And the reverse is true when you're recruiting. But it always amazes me that you all want to post a job to a job board but you won't get out and network. You know, you've got to network too if you're going to really find, especially if you're going after veterans. They want that teamwork, that camaraderie, everything that Ellen talked about, everything that Peter talked about. They, they crave that. Student Veterans of America, if you go, before you even go to a campus, you call up the chapter president and say, hey, I want to network with you a little bit. You know, uh, I'm coming onto campus and these are the types of things that I'm looking for. Which one of the veterans would fit real well with that? I'd like to talk to them. Do you have one that'll fit? How many of you know what a uh, transition assistance program or TAP coordinator is? 
How many of you talk to the, oh, two hands, okay. <laughs> that's on the military basis, three hands now. That, that's the, on the military basis. These are the people that help people transition off of active duty. They can be a tremendous resource for you, and you should be networking with them. Just as I'm sure if you're going to be uh, recruiting somebody from a business school, you call up one of the professors. And you network with the professor and say, hey, I'm looking for somebody who's really good in finance. I'm looking for somebody who's really good in this, blah, blah, blah. Most of you do that, right? No hands yet? <laughs> you know, you need to network. You need to get out there and talk to these people. Um, Employers are part of the Guard and Reserve. That, that group is going to become very important to you because that's a DOD agency whose job it is to soothe things between the National Guard because they get called up so many times and the uh, employers. I'm from Georgia. And you got to understand, members of the Guard and Reserve are part-time soldiers. I did seven years active, 21 in the Reserve. <clears throat> the, out of Georgia, in the last 10 years, the National Guard did six deployments to the sandbox of 12 to 18 months. And most of the members of the National Guard in Georgia were on at least four of those deployments. Now, do you think that makes it hard to keep a job? Yeah, real hard. Uh, we did a study with the 877th of Augusta, did for CNN. It was a program called uh, Hire, Vet, Hire Veterans. And uh, uh, they, before deployment, there's about a 900 person brigade. 140 lost their job. They were cut before they had their orders in hand. So that way the company wasn't susceptible to USERA. And CNN went over to Afghanistan, interviewed all 140, and then followed them for five months when they came back to Georgia. And at the end of five months, only eight had a job. It was a one hour special. I got swamped with phone calls from companies saying, I want to hire one of those. <laughs> but that's a problem they face. And you say, well, I don't want someone who's going to get taken away. Well, unfortunately, that's the way our society is evolving to, is having a part-time military. It's almost like the Spartans. Um, DOL, at, at your local DOL offices, you have ELVERS, well, that's a local veteran employment rep, and you have DVOPS, that's your Disabled Veteran Opportunity Program Manager. And they could help you. And you need to network with them. Now, I've already heard from a couple of you today that you don't like to deal with DOL, but I, know, you know, I, I understand that. <laughs> I chair the OFCCP committee for IEWS, and it's a lot of fun dealing with them, but you still need to go talk to them. You still need to go talk to them. Now, in terms of uh, college job sites, you'll find a lot of veterans will put their, that are going to college will put their, uh, these are some of the better known job sites. And of course, you recognize we have college recruiter there. But uh, uh, there's something that's unique about veterans. They don't like to put their resumes out on the internet. And there's reasons for that, real good reasons for that. Um, because of what they did, there's a lot of people, very friendly, peaceful people out of the sandbox who use job boards to track down people that are in special forces or in SEALs or in intelligence, and they come over here and try to kill them. Many of you may have seen the, uh, uh, or saw it when uh, a s Army sniper went to work with Army recruiting in Arkansas. His fourth day on the job, a bunch of radical Muslims came by and killed him. There was a real classic one out of London, many of you probably remember a couple years ago, where a member of SAS, they cut off his head, his wife's head, and their two kids in their flat there in London. When you go take a look at my LinkedIn uh, background, you don't see any of those spots I used to go to. You have trouble even understanding that I was in the military, but it's important. And so you understand they're not gonna necessarily put the resumes out. So you're gonna need to network and using these other resources will help you a lot. These are your veteran job board sites. There's a bunch of good ones. Um, we get, we get over 700,000 people a month coming through our site. And what we see, for the most part, those who do come off active duty get a job. Not that there aren't some having a problem, but they're getting a job. It's that National Guard and Reserve. 
And there's one other thing I want to mention to you before I finish. There's a uh, there's two misperceptions out there. One deals with PTSD. How many of you think everybody has PTSD in the military? <laughs> you would if you read some magazines. They don't. But let me tell you, if you go into combat, you will have some PTS. I've got PTSD. But the other side of it, some of us get disabled. And the disabled veterans need jobs, and it's a very high unemployment rate among our disabled veterans. I have a plate in my throat and my back. They rebuilt my gut. I have a big mesh in there. They had to rebuild both my shoulders because of being in the military. If I get my rating, I'm going to be a 70% disabled vet. Yet I can still function because you don't care if my body can do all that stuff. What is it you care about? My brain. Does my brain function? Can I solve problems for you? Well, yes. I ran a billion dollar company as a disabled veteran. We can do that stuff. We just want you to bring us in, but don't start me at the bottom. Because I've already been there. And we don't like to conquer the same ground twice. <laughs> So with that, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you very much for having me here. I wanted to change your paradigm a little bit. One sec. Thanks, Ted. Here. Thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. I started out my career working for Navy resale and, chained, and trained mm -hmm. Navy exchange officers. So the transfer to civilian life you know, to, to running a large scale was pretty easy. Um, but today, uh, and I see the jobs that are out there for veterans, and I'm shocked how lousy they are. You know, just the ones from these job fairs, they're low end, you know, uh, you know labor intensive kinds of environments. And um, one of the problems is in the financial industry, you know, there's things, sure, they can, you know, go into a bank and some of these places, but some of the more moving up the scale to start higher, they need m many more technical skills. And I'm appalled that we don't do anything for those veterans to help them make that transition. There's, there's some truth to what you say. But understand there's no job in any of your companies that veterans can't do. Uh, I had somebody came to us one time and said uh, they were looking to hire a CFO. And he said, you probably don't have very many veterans that are CFOs. I said, what do you mean? They get out, they go to business school, they go to work. So we pulled up a bunch of CFO resumes in our database. These guys are asking four to $600,000 a year, which told me I should have majored in finance. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, they're there. They, they forget that they get out and go. In fact, we, we do a lot of work with the International Franchise Association. This was six years ago. And I, when I met with them, and I said, do you know how many veterans are a franchise? And I said, well, there's probably a couple. I said, well, why don't you do a survey of all your membership? 60% of their franchise owners were veterans because they know how to read, they know how to follow directions, they know how to do all this good stuff, and they're very competitive. You have to be competitive on a battlefield. You can't just say, well, I'm going to kind of go into this fight, I'm going to shoot a couple of bullets and hope maybe I don't get a shot. You know? No, you go out there to kill. You go out there to win because that's what war is about. Yes, Peter. Um, as the father of a National Guard Army aviator, uh, you know, the, the uh, problems you identify are absolutely true. So have you got any suggestions for what an employer can do, needs to do, in order to retain these citizen soldiers? Okay. Let me throw this out first. Uh, I've been using this when we go around the country working with the different adjutant generals that run their state National Guards. Now that the wars are kind of solved, gone down, they're going back to the calling them up just one year and six. That's the theory at any rate. Uh, it's not going to work out that way. Most people don't stay on a job more than three years, according to Sherman, 24 to 36 months thereabouts. So if you get somebody who just came back, you don't have to worry about them for six years. That's one thing. Uh, there's a problem for the people in the guard, they, generally in a company they can only go up so high because being a senior manager or a vice president or president just, just doesn't work 
when you're subject to a one-year recall. I was president of a company. I just happened to forget to tell my board of directors that I was a drilling captain in the Navy Reserve. And uh, one of my board members called me, and I was up at NSA. And uh, they said, oh, you're at NSA? Great. We're getting a contract with them? I said, no, I'm a captain in the Naval Reserve Intelligence Program. Long dead pause on the other side. I left three months later. But, uh, but it, it, I couldn't, in, in reality, be president of that company and be subject to being called away for a year. It doesn't work that way. But there are jobs in your company where they can fit. Okay, we've got time for one more question. Just uh, uh, if, if your companies are serious about doing vet recruiting and hiring, there are two points to make which are critical. Uh, most important is learn to become a COI with armed forces recruiting. That means circle of influence. It's a fancy military acronym for going into recruiting stations to say, hi, I recruit in real life. Can I help you mm -hmm. recruit members? or recruit, recruit potential soldiers, airmen, swabbies, what, what, what have you. Uh, I've been doing it for 15 years. Um, I know the heads of recruiting for all the branches. I know uh, the heads of recruiting for the, for the VA and what have you. It's a good little thing to do. So the important thing is if you're going to recruit military, the second point is... That networking thing again. Networking. The second point is stop demilitarization. This isn't like North Korea, South Korea thing here. Demilitarization means, and, and I've heard this ad nauseum from recruiters is to, to veterans, you need to take that military stuff off your resume and, and, make, and, and, and translate it so we can understand it. Does that even make sense? You want to hire, it, the, mil, the veterans are the only group that are asked by companies to negate their experience. Yeah, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of converters out there on different sites. They're all based on one site called ONET. So if you want to find out what somebody's experience in the military, how it equates to jobs in your company, go to ONET, O-N-E-T, and you see, okay, this person was a line officer, this person was an infantryman, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, the, no, you, you, the people who are on live streaming recordings wouldn't be able to hear you. That'd be a first. Um, true story, uh, I, I do a lot of work with veterans, and one of them who was a company commander in the Army, and if you're a company commander, how many, how many soldiers are you uh, responsible for? Anyone know? Other, other, other than those who serve, knucklehead. <laughs> a company is how many? About 20, they're typically, you know, 20, 25 to 45 or so. They were asked, I, you know, I, 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 do you think maybe you can manage two people? You know, this abject ignorance by companies looking to recruit military is as bad as not hiring NG or reserve because they're going to be called up. Follow up what Steve's talking about. Uh, I was speaking to Sherm one time. Uh, I had this one VP of HR. I said, oh, we hired a bunch of military. They all quit on us. I said, oh, really? What did they do in the military? Oh, this one guy said he was a chief something. I said, oh, a Navy chief? She said, yeah, he was in the Navy. And I said, well, what did you have them do? He said, data entry. I said, okay, wait a minute. You took someone who probably managed 100 people, had a good OPTAR operations budget, and was responsible for their lives, literally, and you want them to do data entry, no wonder they quit. They're bored. It helps if you understand that and use some of these resources that will help you. But again, thank you very much for having me here. Thank you, Ted.